proud alumni of University of Texas at Arlington. I am a CompTI A+, Security+, Plus, a VMware VCA DCV, and a SSCP and CISSP from ISC Squared. I'm currently working on my OSCP and GPIN certifications uh, as we speak. I'm happily married. I have two little girls at home, and I'm a member of Shadow Systems as well as the Dallas Hackers Association. Before I go any forward, I just want to let you guys know how awesome it is to be in information security in Dallas. There are so many different organizations as a community. Just a couple I wanted to call out right now is, again, the Dallas Hackers Association, DC214, 2600. The Lab.ms is an incredible hacker space in Plano that I highly recommend you check out. Uh, there's also the North Texas uh, Cybersecurity Group, NTXCSG. There's also the ISC Squared and ISSA meetups. Also, there's other organizations such as Crypto Party, OWASP, Fort Worth is new with the Fort Worth Hackers Association. And November 5th and 6th, I believe, is B-Sides DFW. So a lot to go on if you're interested in information security. So let's go over the agenda real quick. We're going to talk about what uh, ransomware is, talk about ransomware in the news, kind of give a uh, timeline of ransomware from its humble beginnings to where we are now. Uh, and then we're going to do a technical analysis of what's actually happening in a ransomware infection, as well as uh, a look at the topology of a C2 network. Uh, then we're going to talk about evolved ransomware, ransomware outside the scope of the Windows domain. And then also I'm going to leave you guys with some mitigation techniques on how to prevent ransomware and then leave you with some final thoughts. So what exactly is ransomware? It's a form of cyber extortion, basically an online crime involving an attack or threat uh, against a person or enterprise. Basically, you have to pay to get whatever they're demanding back. Uh, there's multiple forms of cyber extortion. The ones in particular are DDoS, there's uh, the simple extortion, and a new one called uh, sextortion. And uh, ransomware falls in the uh, realm of online extortion. Um, so this is the actual definition of ransomware, leveraging a software to inhibit use of a system uh, on the assumption that people will pay to get that service back. Uh, unfortunately, there's no guarantee that you will get that service back if payment is made. Now, ransomware, it is a $1 billion industry as of 2016. Harjavec Group states that $209 million in ransoms were paid in just the first three months of 2016. So that basically equivocates to about a billion dollars in ransomware fine, or, uh, ransoms paid this year. Um, it's important to note that we don't have all the answers as far as the full numbers because not everybody reports it. And so there are some ransoms that have been paid that I'm aware of that are of significant value that have not been reported to uh, law enforcement. So uh, if you guys did hear the keynote addressed earlier, please report, even if you just, if it's a small ransom, it really benefits law enforcement if they're made aware of the circumstances. Uh, it's also important to note that now HIPAA regards a ransomware uh, as a data breach because you've lost control of the data. It may not have been uh, exfiltrated, and the bad guys may not have it, but you lost control of the data and are now responsible for that. Uh, it's interesting to note that Symantec states that only a quarter of American homes back up their data on a regular basis. Now, who actually believes it's 25%? Uh, no. I think maybe 1%, 2% actually back up their data on a regular basis. Um, but it's also interesting to note that over the past 12 months, half, 50% of U.S. companies have reported being affected in some way by ransomware. Now, this is an interesting statistic here, basically the vectors that you're getting uh, compromised by ransomware. And it's uh, pretty prevalent to see that it's really basically mostly coming in through email attachments and through links uh, going to exploited uh, pages. Um, and it's interesting also that you're seeing most of the vectors coming in from your endpoints, your laptops and desktop computers. However, they are coming in from servers, they are coming into your smartphones and tablets, which we'll talk on later. Uh, here are a couple of the ransoms that have been paid as of recently, the, some of the bigger names. Uh, we touched earlier on Hollywood Presbyterian with 40 bitcoins. Horry County School District was paying uh, roughly $8,000 in bitcoin. And most recently uh, in the news was uh, University of Calgary, which paid roughly $15,000, $16,000 in ransomware. Um, just this week, this is uh, stuff I pulled up just last night, the new Mars joke variant uh, campaign was detected. Uh, this was discovered recently in uh, August 1st, but I'm happy to announce that now the decryptor is already available. Uh, so as soon as these variants are coming on board, uh, these uh, analysts are trying to decrypt these things as quickly as possible. 
Um, we've touched on Lockheed earlier. Uh, they originally had the Lockheed file extension. They switched to Zepto. Just as of this week, they've switched the uh, file extension to Odin. Uh, don't be confused. This is not the Odin ransomware variant that exists. This is still Lockheed. Um, also, this is a new one, Princess Ransomware. I think that's interesting. Um, what's interesting about this one is the fact that it's really pricey. We're looking at three Bitcoins initially. And if you don't pay within a certain period of time, they'll wrap it up to, uh, or ramp it up to six Bitcoin. And then my favorite new one, this is the uh, Donald Trump Ransomware. He builds a wall around your files. <laughs> so here's another type of victim of ransomware. Um, and they're not getting their files ransomed, but it's a different type. It's called malvertising. And this is a vector that these malicious actors are leveraging. This is up 325% from 2014 to 2015. Um, what this is doing is leveraging uh, ad content distributors to basically use their ads to dis uh, display um, exploit code. So Angular, Neutrino, things like that. And so uh, there's a large one that came out March 15th. And we found that large number of these really big websites, such as MSN, Answers, NFL, were all distributing real deal ransomware. And as far as I'm concerned, that hurts the company because I'm less inclined to go to that website again. It hurts the brand. It hurts the, you know, um, it, it's definitely not a good thing to have your content being the vector of distributing ransomware. Um, other victims, not just in uh, this particular March 20 or 15th attack, were you know Microsoft companies, Skype, um, let's see, TMZ, Drudge Report. All these are big sites that are spreading ransomware. Uh, this is an interesting little screenshot here. This is from the New York Times, telling people not to click on the, the banners on their website. What's interesting to note: this is from 2009. Or I'm sorry, two, I'm sorry, 2013. So this is not the first time this has happened to them. Uh, I'll be honest, I'm a little apprehensive to go to the New York Times anymore. So let's move forward and we'll actually talk about the history of ransomware from its humble beginnings to where it is now. Um, can anybody tell me when the first case of ransomware was? Anybody? It was actually prior to the internet. 1989, this was the AIDS virus. A gentleman by the name of Dr. Joseph Pop created a virus that would uh, replace the autoexec.bat. And after 90 days, it would encrypt the uh, files on the C drive. You were asked to uh, renew the license and send a, a, a check to a PO box in Panama. Uh, this gentleman was actually arrested by Scotland Yard and served two years in prison and charged with blackmail. Uh, he's, his defense was that the money that he was raising was going to uh, be for AIDS research, but nobody bought it. So now let's move forward to the age of the internet, Reviton. Reviton was really kind of the first version of ransomware, and it's typically done uh, this way with the in, in emulating law enforcement. This came about uh, 2011, and what this would do would lock you out of your PC it would not encrypt your files. Uh, it was fairly easy to get out of because you just boot into safe mode, make a few changes to the registry, and you'd be back in business. Um, what's interesting to note is that um, there's some interesting stories here. Um, a gentleman actually was told that he, and if you look at this, and we touched on this earlier, that you, know, you may have um, child pornography, zoophilia, or whatever. Um, this guy actually did have a hard drive full of it. And he turned himself into law enforcement because of that. Yeah. Um, but at the same time, it, it does take a little bit more of a sinister approach. So a gentleman uh, saw this, thought law enforcement was actually after him, and then took his own life. So it's not just your files that are being damaged. Human lives are at, at stake here as well. So let's talk about cryptocurrency, uh, specifically Bitcoin. Um, I'm a big proponent of Bitcoin. I absolutely love it. There's a lot of uh, reasons for it, particularly the fact that it's an anonymous transaction. It's instantly and secure, and it's not regulated by any central government or authority. But at the same time, that makes it absolutely perfect for extortion and for ransomware. Which takes us to our next uh, variant here, CryptoLocker. CryptoLocker came into the scene oh, about 2013, and this is the price of Bitcoin. Uh, this particular variant spread through the Game Over Zeus botnet, and that was the price right when uh, this particular variant hit the scene. Notice it went from about $250 all the way up to $1,100 in just a few months, and a lot of that is due to ransomware, in particular CryptoLocker. 
This used a method of propagation called the DGA, Domain Generated Algorithm. What this would be do is create a long string of domain or of characters and register that as a domain name. Um, only one or two of this, you know, thousands that were created were legitimate domains. This is one, for example. Uh, just a character string of a bunch of different ones. You know how we can tell this is a particularly malicious domain? Anybody? Yes, exactly. The .ru. And we find that the majority of ransomware right now is um, propagated through Eastern Europe. Um, going forward, this is one of the first variants of ransomware that didn't just go after the local files. This is one that infected uh, network shares in addition to the local shares as well. It used AAS 2048 asymmetrical encryption, which prior to this was using symmetrical encryption. Uh, that's basically having the same password on both sides instead of having a private and public key. Uh, and CryptoLocker is like Kleenex and Xerox is today. It's like the de facto name of ransomware. It doesn't matter what you've been infected, you've basically been CryptoLockered, right? So at the end of 2014, uh, law enforcement was able to actually um, compromise the Game Over Zeus botnet and shut it down. They were able to recover the private keys from the command and control servers that actually were allowed uh, to decrypt compromised systems. Um, but when you cut off the head of a Hydra, what, three or more grow back, the same thing happened here with the ransomware. A bunch of new variants came about shortly thereafter. Uh, this is one in particular, Torrent Locker. This was one that was really big. We didn't see it here in the United States. It was mostly in Australia and New Zealand, so there we go. Um, what this would do is they impersonated red light tickets and uh, tax violations. And if you were a pretty good guy with regex and knew how to block domains, you were pretty good to protect against. So what it was, it was a combination of Australia or New South Wales with a dash, post dot, or gov, followed by whatever top level domain. So if you could do any sort of regex to block those domains, uh, you're, you're pretty safe in that, your corporate environment. Uh, the next one was Alpha slash Tesla Crypt. This one was interesting. These are the uh, what, Cybermen from Doctor Who. If you notice, as time goes on, they constantly are kind of evolving and changing. And that's what was interesting noted about this particular variant. What these guys originally were targeting were video gamers, going after the saved files, the character files of your particular favorite video games. And again, they were using the uh, DGAs for uh, expanding through their C2 servers. Uh, but they evolved. They figured out that Video gamers are great, but we can extort more people. So they just expanded the number of extensions that they started encrypting. Uh, they started using ca uh, hacked websites for uh, command and control rather than using just their own DGAs. And rather than just using spam to propagate, they started using exploit kits, using the malvertising to start spreading in addition to spam. So what's interesting to note about this one was is they started using asymmetric encryption at first. So password A is password A on the other side. Um, so if you could extract that, that key or that password, then you have unencrypted your files. Talos Group was the first to discover this and published it. A week later, the hackers got smart, changed it to asymmetric encryption. Um, it is important to note that version 4.1 was still in the wild as far as April 22nd. But I've got great news. And we touched on this earlier. Um, Tesla Crypt's gone. Um, May 18th. What happened was we noticed that they were switching their malvertising campaigns from uh, Tesla Crypt over to uh, Crypt XXX and some different ones. And one of the researchers got on their chat room and said, hey, look, I noticed you guys are shutting down. Um, can I have your private key? <laughs> and they actually responded and said, yeah. And that's the exact message that they gave and said, sorry. I don't know if they were really sorry, but we were able to... Um, provide decryptors for all versions of Tesla Crypt at this point. So it is dead and gone. Next comes CryptoWall. CryptoWall is very interesting. This one came about in 2014. Again, it started using uh, compromised web servers and exploit kits instead of DGAs. But what's interesting here is the way that it communicated back to the bad actors. They started using these anonymous services called uh, Tor, uh, the onion router, or uh, I2P, for to really kind of mask their tracks back to uh, the malicious servers. 2016, the year of ransomware, as Time Magazine puts it. Um, Enigma Software stated that uh, this or last month, 2016 of September, uh, was the worst month to date for ransomware attacks in the United States. Um, so 
with that, there are so many variances out now that we can't really, we could spend all day talking on each different type. So I wanted to touch on just a couple of the interesting variants that I've seen in the wild just as recently. Uh, this one's called Petya. This is the master boot record encryptor. This one doesn't go after your particular files. It goes after the entire machine. So what it'll do is force a blue screen of death. And then it does a check disk. It's not a check disk. It's faking it and it's actually uh, encrypting your master boot record. So this originally started uh, masquerading as a job application, but since then the actors have gone to invoices and just any sort of mass mail campaign. Um, you download it from a Dropbox, uh, you would have a resume, photo, force that blue screen of death and boom, your entire PC was locked out. The next one that I find really interesting, and you'll start seeing more of this, is Powerware. Uh, with Windows, I think ever since what, XP? I know for ev ever since Windows 7, PowerShell is embedded in every operating system of Windows machine. Um, you can do a lot of things with PowerShell, from systems administration to well, ransomware. What this would do is, again, it originally started as an invoice, and it would use Microsoft Word initially as the macro to execute PowerShell internally. So it would use its, the operating system's own tools to do the uh, file encryption, the uh, primary key exchange. All this was done with just that one dropper. There was no callback to download any malicious software. Uh, and then this one's really, really scary. This one's called Jigsaw from uh, the Saw movies. Uh, and it is absolutely serious. Um, ransom payment, for all general purposes, was fairly cheap, $150. But there was a reason why it was cheap, because they really wanted you to pay. Because if you didn't, every hour it would delete 100 files. Yeah, and permanently gone. Um, so if you thought you were smart and say, I'm going to shut the machine down so the, the cl clock doesn't go down. No, it just reboots and uh, deletes 1,000 files instead. So you had a real incentive to pay that ransom. Luckily, there is a decryptor currently out for this particular version. Uh, and we touched on this earlier just a little bit, the SamSam and MacTub variants. This one is interesting because this didn't go after uh, exploit kits. It didn't go through um, spam emails. This one, particularly when it, we first discovered it was attacking uh, hospitals uh, and subsequently higher education, um, it attacked vulnerable web servers with uh, JBoss. And it was a patchable vulnerability. If these organizations had patched their servers as part of their proper maintenance cycle, they wouldn't have been subjected to this vulnerability. Currently, 3.2 million servers are currently vulnerable to this particular variant of ransomware right now. Um, here's the scary part about this. Once you compromise that one web server, what it will do is pivot, and it will jump and move to different machines in your organization. Because what's worse than having one machine ransomed? all your machines ransomed, right? And that's what this is uh, very scarily doing. Um, so moving forward, this is what, uh, we're gonna move to the technical analysis piece of uh, the ransomware talk. And this is really kind of the phases of a ransomware attack. So first comes the installation where you actually either open up the uh, malicious email or you're exploited through a browser vulnerability or whatnot. Then happens is the geolocation callback. And that is a very important step that we'll talk about shortly. Once the geolocation happens, the primary and pub or public and private encryption keys are exchanged. Once you've done that, you have the green light to encrypt all the files. Once the files are encrypted, then the extortion message is given to the end user and the uh, ransomware cycle is uh, completed. Um, this is what it would look like if you're looking at the traffic. This is what you'd see. So right here, we have the exploit kit, the user HITSO exploit kit. Then you see the geolocation callback. Uh, I highly recommend if you have an ability to block this particular URL, ip-addr.es. Most ransomware variants that we see go to this particular IP or this website to pull an IP address because it's very easy to script against. You go to that website, it provides you just an IP, very easy, you don't have to scrape anything out. Uh, once that geolocation is done, or they have the IP address, it's provided to the C2 servers, and this is where uh, the communication between the back end happens, and that, that's really it. Now, this looks, uh, this right here is the map of what a C2 network looks like, and I just wanna draw attention to this beautiful lady right here. That is my grandmother, and she clicks on everything. 
I have had to uh, fix her machine many, many times. So I figured she'd be a perfect candidate for this. Um, so you'll see this is kind of the cycle here. Either she can go to a, a malvertised website that sends her to an exploit kit, which will then pro go to the geolocation callback, or she could be hit with a phishing email that would do the geo, uh, geolocation callback. Then you have communication to your hacked back end servers that then communicate using Tor or I2P back to your bad guys here. So we touched on the geolocation callback, why it's so important. What it does is it tells the bad guys who you are. Um, also, what it can tell you is, is whether or not you're cool enough to, to compromise. So what, I'm, what that means is, for example, APT prone countries such as Russia, China, uh, if those machines are compromised and this geolocation calls back to it, we can say, ah, well, maybe not. We won't ransom the, this particular machine. We will maybe turn it into a clickjacking server or nothing at all, depending on where the infection occurs. Uh, also, what it will do is display the ransom message in the native language in the country it was exposed to. I've done a uh, demonstration of this where I took the exact same virtual machine, put it one in Mexico City, one here in Dallas, express, uh, exposed it to this exact same variant of ransomware, and it did two things. Presented the ransomware in English and Spanish, but also it provided, um, let's see, it provided the ransom in two different amounts. It was interesting because they understand economy of scale. These guys are smart. My ransomware, or the ransom amount in Dallas was 600. It was only 450 in Mexico City. It's very interesting to note that these guys are aware of our economies of scale. Uh, what it will also do is it'll send back this unique identifier, basically telling the bad actors a little bit about the system. So which campaign it's done, a hash of the machine, a little bit of information about the operating system and the IP address. What this will do is make sure that the system is not infected more than one time. Because they are aware that you know, there are people out there and analysts that are actively fighting against ransomware. And if they can thwart the ability to research it, then they're going to do so. So they'll restrict the infection uh, one time. You can't have the same IP being compromised more than one time. Uh, also, we touched earlier that these variants now can detect if a system is a virtual machine and can possibly um, not encrypt a, a system if it's a, if it's a VM as well. So again, they're trying to thwart the, uh, the, the researchers. So let's move forward, because um, right now we've really only touched on ransomware in Windows. And there's so much more to ransomware than just you know, being infected on a Windows machine. Um, it's evolved. So let's first touch on Linux. This is the Linux encoder ransomware. This one um, is fairly easy. This one was tar uh, targeting web servers, Linux machines running SQL, Apache, and go after the home folder and the web folders. Uh, it would only ask for one Bitcoin, which in all honesty is a fairly small amount. Um, there have been four, no, three versions currently available, and all three were fairly quickly decrypted. So we're fairly confident it was written by this guy right here. Now, let's move forward to OS X. A lot of people use Macs because they say, ah, there's no mal malware, there's no ransomware. Uh, for the most part, you're right, but this is the one that got through the cracks. Um, this one was in uh, March 4th. Uh, it was downloaded 6,000 times before they discovered what was going on and shut it down. Um, what this was was a combination of the source code from the Linux encoder that we just talked on combined with this educational ransomware on GitHub called Hidden Tier that was developed in Turkey. So what's interesting here is that this was um, a website called uh, a BitTorrent uh, client, open source, called Transmission had their website and was providing their source code free and available to their end users. They compromised that website and hacked the website, added the malicious source code to the GitHub page and provided it. Uh, they also um, did an MD5 hash of it. So if you check the hash on the website to the source code, it all checked out. Um, what's also interesting is, is that in order to execute um, any binary on an Apple machine, you have to have a uh, developer key in order for it to properly execute. And a legitimate developer key was being used for this particular variant. Um, it just happened to be developed, uh, the developer was in Turkey, which is an interesting correlation because Hidden Tier was also developed in Turkey. Um, so as soon as they figured that out, they shut down, they took out the developer key access, and any of uh, the software that was out in the wild was rendered invalid. It could not execute. So uh, I do applaud um, Apple for providing that level of security, and that, that is a very good thing. Um, moving forward, 
let's move into mobile phones. Uh, this is ransomware with air quotes because um, it, it met all the uh, requirements for ransomware, but it really wasn't. This one was called Oleg Plus. This was uh, mainly discovered originally in 2014 in Australia. These weren't people that were downloading software through malware or um, through, through emails or exploit kits. These were victims of phishing. Um, if you are an uh, Apple user and have iCloud access, I'm sure you're familiar with this functionality. If you've lost your phone, you have the ability to lock it and possibly remotely wipe it. That's what these guys were doing. They would just fish these guys' email accounts, their iCloud accounts, remotely lock it, and if you didn't send the money, they would wipe the machine. Um, fairly ingenious, and to this day, there are still people that are replicating this attack. Um, Luckily, in regards to this situation, a uh, Russian official did arrest two people and prosecuted them for their crimes. Uh, now, moving forward to Android. The Android is an interesting topic because of the fact that their way of distributing software is so different from Apple's. Uh, Apple has a walled garden approach to their software distribution, where Android is a little bit more uh, open. So I, there are so many different variants of ransomware in the um, Android field that we can't really touch on all of them. But I wanted to touch on, I believe, two that really I thought were interesting. One is Ziplocker. This was the first one that really kind of emulated the ransomware that you see on the Windows side. What this would do was, uh, previously, all they would do is lock your screen. Again, it was the same way. You just boot into safe mode, remove a few registry edits, and you're, you're back in business. But this is the first one that actually did it file encryption. It only targeted a couple of the your, your photos. Uh, since then, they have expanded to more uh, file extensions. Um, but it actually encrypted it. Uh, it also was the first ransomware variant to start using uh, uh, Tor and I2P for the back-end communication. Um, luckily, there is a decryptor currently available for this particular version, but there are many, many, many more that are currently in the wild that are not, uh, decryptors are not available. So be careful where you surf. Now, this is the most evil software I think I've ever seen. This is adult player, extortion at its finest. Masquerades as a porno movie player. And it, it does exactly as it says it does. The problem is, is while the app is in use, it's also using the front-facing camera to take photographs. Yeah. So then it locks you out. And if you don't pay, it will actually send those photos to everyone on your contact list. Yeah. Like I said, evil, evil, evil. Luckily, it is easy to fix. So what's next? What's next in the world of ransomware? Yeah? Oh, same as before, boot in a safe mode um, and follow the instructions provided by either uh, Kaspersky Labs or Symantec. I really I think like Kaspersky Labs is one of the best combating ransomware at this time. So I just, I basically bookmark them and check them out daily. <laughs> so what's next? What's next in the world of ransomware? The Internet of Things. Uh, Institute for Critical Infrastructure Technology says that IoT present, uh, presents an infinite attack surface. Uh, not just ransomware. Uh, if you guys have been paying attention to the InfoSec news recently, Krebs on Security was shut down by, what, a one terabit DDoS attack using IoT as the vector for attack. So IoT is a great advance in technology, but unfortunately there's very, very little security preventing that. So. That's why we think IoT is the next vector for ransomware. Um, what's next? Um, pacemakers and insulin pumps have already been proven vulnerable to uh, ransomware. Uh, automobiles have been driven off the road. Um, we saw that at DEF CON last year. Uh, and in your house, of all things, this, this is a great comic. It shows all the different things that could be ransomed. But I have some bad news, guys. The future is now. 2014, or I'm sorry, 2016, at DEF CON 24, researchers were able to provide a proof of concept um, thermostat being locked out. And so what they were able to do is lock out until Bitcoin was paid, and they could also turn up and down the temperature at will so they could freeze you out of your house or turn up the heat. It, it's literally. So um, we're going to be seeing more of this as we speak. So let's talk about mitigation, how to prevent this, how to protect yourselves, how to stop this. I got a lot here. <laughs> back up, back up often, back up as frequently as you can. Um, but here's the kicker though, 
disconnect your backups when they're not in use. Because unfortunately, if you have your backups connected to your network, they can also get encrypted. So disconnect your backups when they're not in use. Uh, additionally, review who has access to your critical files. Not everyone in your organization needs access to your financial or your payroll records or anything to that degree. I think reviewing your access is uh, fairly important to prevent uh, your important files from being ransomed. But also, disconnect your network shares when not in use. Uh, if you're uh, in control of an organization's uh, endpoints, what I highly recommend is stopping the network connection to your mapped drives upon boot up. It may be easier for your end users because their map drives are already there, but in the event that they're compromised, their network shares are already there. So allow access to your network shares, but don't make it so easy that your endpoints can be compromised and then have the ransomware reach out to it super easy. So just disconnect it. Uh, also, train your end users about social engineering techniques. Learn about these uh, programs. They're very valuable. But the most thing uh, I want to impart on people in regard about training social engineering is to be aware of phishing. Phishing, phishing, and phishing. This is the main vector for ransomware uh, that we're seeing going into corporate and enterprise organizations. Uh, also, this seems simple enough, but antivirus. Um, antivirus is picking up the signatures of known malware variants, and these are variants that may be still in the wild and are infecting machines. Just because, you know, it may not pick up every zero day or every new variant that we're finding on the market, but it is affecting and protecting organizations. But the key here is to keep your ransomware, I'm, I'm sorry, your malware, uh, AV updated, because we have to be able to have, be aware of those um, signatures in order to protect against them. Uh, additionally, patch your OSs, patch your systems, patch, patch, patch. Uh, in regards to the SamSam MacTub variant, again, if these guys had patched their systems, they wouldn't have been exposed to these particular variants. And this is fairly well put. You can't exploit vulnerabilities that have been patched. Uh, also, prevent malvertising in, in, a, in a code injection using ad blockers. Now, ad blockers can be kind of uh, a, an interesting conversation because you are blocking people's ability to make money off ads. Um, so I have to have a level of trust with the content that I'm going to. So I will disable my ad blockers on, content, on websites that I trust, but I'm sure not going to disable it when I go to New York Times. So these are just a couple of the ad blockers that I highly recommend. Adblock, uBlock Origin, and Ad Defender are all great products. If you're a little bit more uh, adventurous, I also like to recommend NoScript. This will disable Flash, JavaScript, and a bunch of different scripting uh, languages that will prevent uh, ransomware from being able to inject themselves into your operating systems. However, it does prevent um, some br your browsing experience to some degree. So use this with a, with a bit of caution. And then also Sandboxy is a great tool because it will virtualize uh, your web browser uh, experience into memory. So uh, once you tear it down, it doesn't exist and the binaries can't get out of that sandboxed environment. Um, what I'm happy to announce is, is that Mozilla, Chrome, and IE are all building this sandboxing technology into their next generation browsers. So I applaud, applaud these companies for doing that. Uh, and interestingly enough, end of life. End of life, it's called that for a reason. If you have hardware that is vulnerable to zero days, the majority of these zero days that we're seeing are on end of life software. Uh, most recently with the, um, um, what was the NSA hack, a lot of the exploits that they were discovering were zero days on end of life to Cisco hardware. So if your hardware, your systems are approaching end of life, upgrade them or move on to different uh, software and hardware. Moving forward, trusted sources. It sounds simple enough, but only install software from people and organizations that you trust. This would not be a trusted source right here. Um, follow the pack. There's no reason to be cutting edge unless that's what you do for a living. And then you've already probably taken those precautions. Um, you do not have to be the first 100 people that install software. Uh, I typically recommend waiting till 5,000 or more downloads, maybe more. Um, in regards to Apple, Apple is fairly safe um, because of the fact they do have that walled garden approach to their app development and release. Um, but there are times in which bad code does fall through. We've seen that already. Um, Android, totally different. Instead of having to trust the marketplace, you need to trust the developer. Uh, it's also interesting, to, I need to impart this, 
don't install APKs from sources you don't know. If you have a software provider that says, hey, download this APK, no, wait until it's on a market, wait till it's been downloaded a thousand times or more and verify that what you're downloading is safe. And this is a bit controversial. Because of the issues with transmission and OSX Key Ranger, the federal government is uh, requiring, not requiring, but requesting you to avoid their banks in the FFIEC report to avoid open, soft, uh, open source software. They're actually penalizing organizations for the amount of open source software that they have. I'm a hacker. I love my open source and you can take it from my cold dead hands. So what I would recommend that you do is validate your hashes but not necessarily from the same source that you download it from. Go to a different website and validate your hashes from the site that you're downloading your content from because the chances of both those sites being hacked is probably not gonna happen. Um, let's see, moving forward. Intrusion prevention systems are incredibly powerful in preventing malware, ransomware, uh, exploitation, and whatnot. But the problem is, is that so many organizations are gun shy about implementing this that they don't put it into a block mode. They just put it into monitor mode. And if you've guys seen those commercials with the termite inspector that goes, yep, there's termites, that's about the same extent here. You're not actually doing anything other than just alerting to it. Uh, also, this is a pipe dream. I don't expect this to actually happen, but this is ideally, I would love to see content providers responsible for their banner systems instead of leveraging these third-party ad content providers to provide banner content on their behalf. Uh, that basically requires a marketing department for every single website, but I really do think that web content providers should be responsible for the content that they're distributing on their own websites. Um, so that, again, it's a pipe dream, but ideally I would love to see that happen. And then macros, really? There are uh, GP update or uh, settings you can enable in your Active Directory to prevent ran, uh, um, macro rows from executing. Um, should your environment require macros, um, just disable it from the get-go and then enable it on uh, you know, re re the requirement. But I highly recommend disabling macros from executing in your environment. Now, as far as preventing advanced um, malware, like that MacTub SamSam -Sam that pivot across your organization, and this applies to any type of malware really, is trying to avoid lateral movement. Um, if you can pivot from multiple machines, you can compromise an entire domain. Uh, I've actually done talks and done demonstrations where I can take uh, from a malicious email to a full-on golden ticket domain compromise. We can do that in four minutes. And if you just take some of these uh, initial steps, you can prevent all of it. One is prevent password reuse. Don't have the same password on multiple systems. And this is applicable to end users too. Don't have the same password as your Yahoo, as your LinkedIn, as your Facebook, uh, because as we know, we just lost, what, 500 million, almost a billion email accounts on Yahoo. That's all exposed on the dark web now. So um, check out Have I Been Pwned uh, to check to see if your account has been compromised as well. Uh, additionally, Rotate your passwords as frequently as possible. Um, because in the event that a password or a system has been compromised, uh, if you rotate your password, that previous password is rendered null and void. Uh, and this is applicable to enterprise systems as well. So constantly rotating your passwords as much as possible. Uh, now this is a concept we touched on a little bit earlier, enabling least privilege. Not everybody requires administrative rights in order to run their machines. Uh, for the most part, um, this is a point that we haven't touched yet on, all the variances of ransomware that we've touched on and discussed did not require administrative access. However, some of the more advanced functionality that we're seeing in the ransomware variants that are doing the lateral movement do require some administrative rights. Um, but compounded by um, application control, really restricting what binaries can execute in your enterprise will prevent ransomware entirely. Um, I'm not going to be a sales guy or anything, but there's a product that Cyber uh, offers that provides least privileged and application control. We've thrown 100,000 different variants of ransomware at it, and not a single one has been able to compromise our systems. Uh, I get really nervous when I say 100%, but we stand by that claim. Um, so we, if you can restrict the uh, binaries from ever executing, then you can prevent the ransomware compromise. But that's kind of an unrealistic expectation. So what we have is a concept called gray listing. So if you're unaware of the binary, you're not sure what it does or what it can do, we can actually allow it to execute but run in almost sandboxed mode. So you can prevent the I, uh, 
uh, executable from calling back out to the internet to prevent that key exchange. You can prevent access uh, to the local file system or the network share, really kind of ramping down what that ransomware can do. So again, I want to bring this home and take this to heart. Application control complemented with uh, least privilege will defeat ransomware. Uh, and lastly, isolate your critical resources, your tier zero assets, your domain controllers, your DNS systems, your ESXi hosts, the things that your organization has to have in order to operate. You can protect that by isolating who has access to it and preventing and it really kind of funneling through a proxied bastion host. That will prevent the hashes from being exposed to your endpoints and really provide an additional layer of protection on your organization. So. Uh, that r almost wraps up the uh, talk here, so let me give you a couple of uh, final thoughts. Reasons why you should pay. Well, you get your files back. Maybe. There have been uh, recently a few different variants where they just delete your files and you don't get your files back. But for the most part, it's in the best interest of these bad guys to deliver. Because if there's a track record of not paying and getting your files back, then your people are just going to stop paying the ransom. Um, previously, the FBI actually did say to go ahead and pay. It's the easiest path. This was a few years ago, um, and they have subsequently changed their uh, position on it. But previously, they said, yeah, sometimes their code is so good that it, the easiest way to get your files back is to pay. Um, and conceivably, it might actually be cheaper to pay the ransom to get your files back than suffer the consequences of it. But I disagree. This is why you shouldn't pay. Uh, Chris Stengel from the FBI Cyber Division stated, the FBI does not condone the payment of ransom. Uh, payment of extortion monies encourages criminal activity and be used for serious crimes. And I absolutely agree with them on that. Because now, everybody's in agreement. US CERT, FBI, everybody says no. Do what you can, don't pay the ransom. It might be cheaper from the initial position, but ultimately it's not especially if you have to disclose this information. Uh, a few years ago when Anthem was breached, just in postage, just in postage, how much do you think they had to pay? Anyone? Million. million? Yeah. Anyone else? Multiply that by nine. Nine million dollars just in postage stamps. Imagine what additional costs were incurred in that. So um, should you have to, that's why we really recommend not uh, paying the ransom. Also, copycats, they're, they're out there, and these guys talk amongst themselves. If you know an organization is compromised and you know they probably don't have the security in place to protect themselves, that allows other organizations to go in and right behind them and do the exact same thing. We're actually seeing variants of ransomware now that will go in and have in their encryption list the extensions of other encrypted malware. So they'll double encrypt it. it, it it's crazy. And ultimately, there's no guarantee that you're going to get your files back. Um, there are cases where people have paid and the bad guys will say, ah, no, you need to pay me again. And this will continue to happen until they just give up. So I really stand by the, the fact I don't think people should be paying for their ransoms. And ultimately, the, the criminals win. We, we just don't want that to happen. There are, this is funding uh, many different things. We know organized crime in Eastern Europe. Uh, this, we have seen where organized crime is being protected by government entities. And these are all, it's kind of a gray area between uh, the mafia and the APTs now. And so we don't want to propagate that. So what happens if you're a mom and pop or a personal user and you've been compromised by ransomware? What do you do? Contact your friendly neighborhood hacker. These are the people that will help you. What I recommend you do is provide as much information as possible. Research your compromise. Find out the extension. Find out the website. Show me the email uh, in which you were compromised by. I was actually uh, contacted by somebody that was compromised by ransomware, and we were able to get this person's files back just by getting this sort of information. Um, take the machine offline immediately. Um, there's a lot going on behind the scenes rather than just encryption nowadays. There are versions of XXX cryptoware that are doing more than just this encryption. What they're also doing is installing rats, pulling passwords, and providing that passwords back so that you're getting information theft or identity theft in addition to having your files ransoms. So take your machine offline. Change all your passwords. Because again, you don't necessarily know what you have been exposed to. In addition to losing your files, you may have lost your identity as well. Um, and also wait. Wait as long as you have to. Because 
people are coming up with these decryptors all the time. We just saw it earlier with the Mars variant where it, we had the exposure on, and then one month later we had a decryptor available. There are versions out that are not decrypted yet, but I promise with the way processing is going, there will be decryptors available. We just don't know how long. So the one thing I want you guys to take away from this is this. Another quote from my, or a quote from my grandmother. An ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. If you take the proactive steps now to protect yourselves, you don't have to worry about paying the ransom to begin with. So do the things like I recommended. Take your backups. Uh, install your ad blockers, things like that. And if you can do that, then you won't have to be suffering through a ransomware infection. So thank you very much. If you have any questions, I'll be more than happy. And uh, everybody who asks a question gets a candy bar. Uh, no, actually, I don't recommend antivirus on the iPhone in particular. Uh, I think Lookout for Android is a good product, but um, because of the way that OS X and Apple really do their software development, I don't really think that there's a good product on the market currently. Yes? Um, I absolutely adore ransomware. Uh, not ransomware. Um, I do. But um, I have Kaspersky Labs. Um, they have a product called the Rano Decryptor that I've used multiple times. If you just check out their website, um, another thing I like to do is Google this week in ransomware. Um, Kaspersky Labs. Um, Symantec also has a really good uh, lab for combating uh, malware as well. It depends. If you have an agent that's installed that's syncing, you're absolutely vulnerable. But if you're just using the web interface to, to sync your data, then no, you're, you're, you're perfectly fine. <laughs> yes? What about VPNs? VPNs? No. You're, you're equally as likely to get uh, infected because it's just protecting the, the session. Uh, it will not protect you from being exploited. Oh! That's a first. I'm going to just be handing these back for now. Yes. <laughs> yeah, in the back. What I see more of is, um, and it depends on the variant particularly, uh, certain variants do what I call a pray and spray where they'll just email everybody versus other ones like, um, oh, there was a, I can't remember which one off the top of my head, but they were using it as a spear phishing technique. So ultimately it depends on the variant of ransomware. Um, so it's just, it depends. Yes, you. No, it, not all variants do that. There are certain ones that have the asymmetric encryption, so that it does not need to do the uh, geolocation callback. There are other ones that have a uh, fallback in the event that the geolocation fails, that it will use another asymmetric key. So um, it doesn't always, but for the most part, we're finding the large majority do that geolocation callback. I got time for one more question. Yes. I think as long as anything's combating ransomware, I am all for it. Um, I think that you need to keep an eye on both because they're developing decryptors at, for different variances at different times. Um, so just be aware. Um, I will say from my personal experience, I've only used the Rano decryptor uh, with great success. Um, so, but as, like I said, as long as somebody's combating it, I'm all for it. So if you have any more questions, I will be available and um, I just hit me up and I'll give you my email as well. Thank you again.